Hey everybody, uh, this video might be a little bit late, uh, you might think, but when you did your assignments and took your test and had to talk about salt and how these sayings were used in the Gospels, I tried to not be nitpicky at all uh, as to how you took them, except for the fact that I wanted to see you comparing them to some extent relating it to the synoptic problem. But I wanted to point your attention to um, just how how difficult this question is of what salt means. Uh, many times we sort of take this meaning for granted. Uh, in Scripture, ironically, because we want to get Scripture right, we sort of safeguard our interpretations and don't ask critical questions. By critical, I mean, well, what does this really mean? Sometimes we want to safeguard an interpretation, and it might not be correct, or if not uh, completely wrong, it might not be fully correct. And in this course, we're sort of doing a 3,000-foot flyover of the New Testament, and I wanted to give you a video where you can sort of appreciate just how much research goes into uh, the New Testament, and hopefully uh, how much research you will be doing over the course of your ministry. Uh, this course is not a one-stop shop by any means, it's just preparing you. So, this is an article uh, written several years ago now by Don Garlington in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society called The Salt of the Earth and Covenantal Perspective. I don't agree with him on every point, and not everything I say in this video will agree with him. I uh, encourage you to check it out, though. Lots of great food for thought. Uh, no pun intended there with food and salt, but... Basically, he argues, and I can agree with this, that salt is a covenant idea and that the metaphor functions in different ways in different contexts, but it's always a covenant idea. So let me take you to a few texts that he points out here. One is uh, Leviticus 2.13, and a good commentary will take you here as well. But Leviticus 2.13 says, Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. So one thing about Leviticus is that the author, uh, Moses presumably of Leviticus, um, loves to use groups of three. And if he uses three of something, it's probably very important. And you notice he mentions salt three times. Season with salt. So that the salt of the covenant, and that's your really key phrase there, uh, shall not be lacking, and with all your offerings you shall offer salt. So three times there. Okay, another one that Garlington mentions, another passage is Second Chronicles 13.5. And in this passage we have the idea, or we have the event rather, of Jeroboam and Rehoboam and um, who's the kingdom going to go to, uh, sort of contention here. And it says, Do you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the rule over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt? And so uh, Garlington points to this idea of permanency. And here is where the idea of salt as a preservative is probably on the right track, but it's not the whole story. So salt preserves. It has this idea of permanence. Uh, also, it wasn't destroyed by fire. And so it probably had a significance that way. And it's specifically connected to the permanence of the covenant. It's not just permanence for permanence sake. Um, salt shouldn't be understood the way Jesus uses it as a preservative, as in we're trying to keep the world from getting worse. It's actually, as Garlington helpfully points out, it's a positive thing. It's you are the salt of the earth. And we can better appreciate why the salt is intended for the earth for the earth's benefit, when we see that salt uh, is also, it's not just making a covenant with God, it's the way you conclude a covenant in the ancient world, is you would offer the offering with salt, and then you would partake of the meal from that offering. The whole offering isn't, bu isn't uh, burned up to God, unless it's a whole burnt offering, but you partake in the offering. And that's part of the significance of sacrifices, is that there's fellowship to it. And so, if you recall in Exodus, after they uh, make the covenant, they have a meal together. And it says they go up on the mountain, uh, the elders of Israel, Moses and Aaron, and they see God. And you're thinking, 
if you're paying attention, wait, they can't see God. And yet this idea of a covenant meal was very important. And we know from other cultures outside of the Bible that salt was a big part of these meals. Uh, salt sometimes had its own plate. And so salt was a very important symbol in this regard. So salt seems to be a covenant term. Turning to uh, Matthew and how Jesus is using this idea of salt, as most of you pointed out, Matthew's salt saying follows the Beatitudes. And if we understand the Beatitudes correctly, they essentially say one thing, and that is the afflicted righteous are blessed. Uh, the Beatitudes are broken into two sets of four. The first set of four ends with blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Okay. The second set ends with blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. What ties the two together? Righteousness, hungering and thirsting for it, being persecuted for it. Once we understand that, we can see how each and every beatitude fits into that. So the first three and the first set of beatitudes happen to be descriptions of what it looks like to be persecuted for the sake of righteousness, to be poor in spirit, to be mourners, to be not meek, or we could use the word, but it's probably misleading, but humbled. And that word, uh, praus in Greek, almost exclusively translates the idea uh, in the Hebrew Bible, as we go into the Greek translation of the Septuagint, of the afflicted, the anavim, the afflicted righteous, normally. And so, in other words, we have three afflicted states. Blessed are the persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does that look like? Well, to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to be peacemakers. Those are the first three ideas in the second set of Beatitudes. So the Beatitudes, uh, they have these various things that they say, but they're all about one thing. The afflicted righteous are blessed. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we could go into more detail, but that's basically what they're about. Now, the summary Beatitude, and it should be seen this way as a summary when we see that, verses 11 and 12, Blessed are you when... They revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil about you falsely on account of me, uh, etc. This is a summary beatitude. Uh, when you follow Christ, you're righteous. When you're persecuted, you're blessed. And it also transitions us into the salt saying and the saying of the light of the world. Uh, blessed you are, literally in Greek. Blessed este, you are. And then este, the uh, salt of the earth. Este the light of the world. We transition straight from the Beatitudes into these sayings. And it would make sense if the salt of the earth and the light of the world continue the idea that the afflicted righteous are blessed. So, taking that idea, uh, we've thought of salt as a covenant idea. You're the salt of the earth, okay? You are those who are righteous before the earth, and you are potentially those who will be afflicted as such. Now, when we take that meaning to the Beatitudes, we see something interesting. And that is that in Matthew and in Luke, it uses an interesting word. Um, become tasteless here is the word. In Greek, this is morino, which does not mean become tasteless, but it means to become foolish. It's a passive idea to be made foolish. Uh, we might want to say to be made out to be foolish. And if we actually look this word up in BDAG, one of the, or really the standard Greek lexicon of the New Testament, we see that it means make foolish, show to be foolish, and it has a entry for make tasteless, which is the common interpretation here, that, as I'm sure you all know. But notice that the only two texts it's able to give for that meaning are Matthew and the parallel in Luke. And other dictionaries are the same way. Uh, they tend to, to think that the words being used metaphorically to be made tasteless 
but we shouldn't overlook the fact that the world word means, and Garlington goes into this, although he doesn't conclude quite what I do, that it should be made if the salt is made out to be foolish. And it seems to be this idea of the afflicted righteous. The salt's made out to be foolish. This is something, the, the way that salt is treated. And what does Jesus say? Um, he says, literally, in what will it be salted? Well, you don't salt salt. And so this is a, a difficult question, in other words. And we can try to sort of safeguard the meaning, ironically, because we care about what the Bible says. And we can kind of safeguard our interpretation. But these questions are all questions we need to answer. What does it mean? Uh, in what will it be salted? Well, that could be taken the way it's traditionally taken as how will it be made salty, but it's literally to be salted. You don't salt salt, you salt other things. And so it seems to be uh, in what way will it be salted or for what purpose will it be used as salt or uh, we could take it different ways. Uh, into what will it be salted? On what will it be salted? These are all uh, translations that we could easily use to translate the idea. It's a hard question. We shouldn't overlook it. Okay, so keeping in mind that the afflicted righteous are blessed, the idea of salt is covenant idea, you are the salt of the earth, but if it's made out to be foolish, uh, uh, in what purpose, on what will it be salted, uh, it is sufficient for nothing except to be cast out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, uh, I have in Logos here an interesting feature, and that is when I hover over a word, it highlights others in the context, and you notice something immediately. In Greek, it's much clearer. You have by the men, literally, trampled by the men. You come to the light of the world, thus let your light shine before the men. And so what do we have here? We have, on the one hand, salt, being trampled underfoot by men, on the other hand, your light shining and being seen before the men, and they will glorify your Father in heaven. So what, is, what do these sayings, uh, or what are they about? Well, it seems to be that Jesus, consistent with the meaning of the Beatitudes, the afflicted righteous are blessed. If your salt is treated as foolish, and if it's trampled underfoot by men, 